And um, we invited a lecturer uh, tonight um, who worked as a journalist uh, with several um, um, quite renowned international media, such as The Independent and Wall Street Journal, was a correspondent in Turkey and the Middle East, and uh, currently works for the Crisis Group, which is an independent non-profit NGO committed to preventing and resolving deadly conflict. And uh, he has written extensively on the basis of uh, his experiences in more than 20 countries. He has written several books, uh, uh, for example, uh, Turks, A Many-Faceted Identity, and um, uh, Dining with Al-Qaeda and Sons of the Conquerors. And I'm very, very happy to uh, be able to announce to you our lecturer for tonight, who will give us an introduction into Turkey, Mr. Yu Pope. The floor is yours. Thanks very much indeed. <clears throat> well, I must say that it is a very it may be in Princess, Princess Maxima or Queen Maxima now who said this, but it is a very direct Dutch statement, isn't it? The Turk does not exist. Um, and, but I'm, uh, as, uh, as you may or may not know, I'm British. So um, as you, uh, it's one of our, the things about British people is that we actually never give any direct answers to any questions. <laughs> and also because uh, I live in Turkey where it's actually extremely dangerous legally to try and make this statement, uh, you, could, uh, you could get easily into legal trouble for insulting Turkishness. And um, so I'm going to uh, use my inherited and adopted, I've lived half of my life in Turkey, uh, my adopted uh, rights to, to uh, give a roundabout answer to the question of what, what is Turkish identity um, this evening. And I'll do it by um, taking you on, a, on quite a long journey. Um, it's not just uh, a journey across uh, geography or, or, or space. And um, when I wrote the, my book, uh, Sons of the Conquerors, about what, what, who are the Turks, uh, I actually traveled to Turkish communities in 24 countries to try and get the answer to the question which I'm going to try to give you tonight. Um, but uh, I'd also like to, to explore some of the, the, the many layers that you can find in Turkish identity and all the, the, difficult, um, the difficult terrains of ideology and, uh, and religion that have gone into uh, the, what we think of uh, as Turkishness today. But first I'd like to start with some basic orientation, if I can make this work. Yeah. So here you have the, 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 the typical place of Turkey. It's, uh, in the middle of nowhere or in the middle of everything. Istanbul, the famously the city that Napoleon said that if there was only one city that would govern the world, it would be Istanbul. So he saw it as in the middle of everything between Europe and Asia. Um, however, it's also, uh, if you look at it, it's also something of an island. Very long coastline, um, rather cut off actually. And uh, if you think about it, not really part of Europe, not really part of the Middle East, not really part of Asia. Uh, a somewhat lonely country um, that, uh, that has, uh, uh, sees itself also somewhat uh, alone. And um, it's, it's about 80 million people live, live in Turkey today. About 15% uh, of them are Kurdish ethnically, but the rest of the people probably think of themselves as, as Turks. The most polls in Turkey uh, show that 60% uh, or so of, of people think of themselves as Turks. But there you immediately get into an, a, a typical identity problem is that 100 years ago, those same people would have called themselves Muslims. The people who say today the dictum of the, the Republic of Turkey now is how happy is he who says he is a Turk uh, or she. Um, would have said 100 years ago, thanks be to God, I am a Muslim. And it would be the same, the per same person's grandparents who would say that. And um, it's, uh, <clears throat> I suppose this is a splitting heads, but um, in, in English anyway, uh, I think you can see the, the, the way these two parts of the Turkish identity are two sides of the same coin, in that um, for my father's generation at least, uh, when you said someone was turning Turk, that meant they had become a Muslim. So Turkishness and Islam very, very, uh, very much interwoven. Um, 
because it's perhaps a bit alone, um, Turkey has many ideas about itself. It often builds itself up into being something much bigger than it really is. And uh, just to give you an idea of where Turkey uh, fits in other people's views of, of Turkey, this is the Euro note, and you can see what's left of Turkey um, there. Now, um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's not illogical in that uh, Western Turkey is the most Europeanized part of Turkey. But uh, it's, it's a real shame. It doesn't really do justice to what Turkey's really like. Uh, if, if, if you were to choose a basic orientation of Turkey, it looked as though it was most sort of balanced between Middle East, former Soviet Union, and Europe. But actually, it's much more European than it is any of the other things. And one indicator of that, as many of you will know, there are hundreds of thousands of Turks in, in Holland. Um, and they are part of a community of about 5 million people of Turkish origin who live in, in Europe. Um, and that compares, by the way, to less than 100,000 people who live in either the, the um, uh, former Soviet Union or the Middle East. But actually, probably nowadays, only about 50,000 people of Turkish origin live in, in the Middle East. And you can tell from trade flows. Most of Turkey's trade is with Europe. Three quarters of Turkey's inward investment is from, is from Europe. And if you look at Turkish Airlines, that very central, based in Istanbul, that very central city, uh, almost all of its heavily trafficked routes are to Northern Europe. So when you're looking at Turkey's identity, it, it may seem like it's the other, but actually when you're uh, part of Turkey, Europe is, uh, feels uh, much closer. But um, again, perhaps a bit like uh, uh, Britain, many people in Turkey talk about going to Europe. Uh, they talk about when you cross the Bosphorus Bridge across the Bosphorus in Istanbul, there's a big sign at the, uh, at the other end of it saying, welcome to Asia. And it's, it's, very like, uh, it's very like Britain in that people in Turkey feel that they have a right to be part of Europe, but they also feel that uh, uh, they are not, probably not actually Europeans. And um, just to give you an idea of um, how, much, how much Turkey can really make of itself in the world. It really feels that Europe is its counterpart. When President Erdogan talks about Europe, he feels like he's negotiating with an equal. Uh, and when he talks to the United States, it sometimes feels that he's more important than the United States. But uh, I just put this up to show that, the, that Turkey has quite a lot of growing to do before it gets there. But to... To, to just make sure that you appreciate the complications of the, the Turkish identity, there are very good reasons why Turkey would feel in its, or Turks, would feel in their, in their historical and genetic background much more than this small picture. For instance, there's another way of Turks feeling about themselves, and that is that most Turks are Muslims. And as such, they feel part of the Muslim world, which is pretty big. Um, and uh, of the 53 or so states that are members of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, um, Turkey is arguably the most democratic, or at least, should we say, the most pluralistic. It's got the, probably the best organized economy. It's got some of the best uh, production companies. It's got uh, the world's biggest airline in terms of places flown to. And um, it did used to be, for 400 years, the home of the caliph of the Sunni Muslims, with, who are the pale color there. I'm completely colorblind, but I think it's um, yes, the pale, pale yellowy, if it's green or yellow, I'm not sure, but anyway. Um, that's the Sunni Muslims, and the darker one is the Shia Muslims. So Turkey, uh, although it's given up having the caliph in, 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 in Istanbul or anymore, uh, it does have this memory of being something bigger. And if, in my international crisis group where I work now, we're often coming up with incidences like in what we think of as Somaliland or Brit ex-British Somaliland or Somalia, you'll suddenly find that, that the Somalis have a, a, a very close feeling for Turkey that is related to this map, this feeling of being a Muslim, part of the, 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 the Muslim community. But that's not the only sense of being bigger than just Turkey that Turkey has. And this is the, the Turkic world. Um, this was the subject of, of, the, of the book that I wrote because when I went to Turkey in, in the late 1980s, I genuinely had no idea that there was anybody outside Turkey who spoke Turkish. 
It was, it, was it was astonishing to me when I had a message, and I used to work for Reuters news agency, from, and I got a message from Beijing saying, could, Hugh, could you check out a story? There's someone in Istanbul who's making trouble in the streets of, of Western China, uh, and they're, they're marches and they're calling his name. And I went to find this person. It turned out that this person had run a Turkic Republic in Western China in the late 1940s and had taken refuge in Turkey. Um, and it became clear that actually in China, in this western bit of China here, um, Xinjiang province, which is about one-sixth of the landscape, land surface of China, until about 30 years ago was mostly Turkic speaking. It's now only about half Turkic speaking because of ruthless Chinese policies of, of colonization of that area, or rather integration of that area. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, we learned that all this area was Turkic speaking. Bits of, uh, bits of Mongolia, the, the, the Kizil Republic of Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. As I said, 24 countries have Turkic, Turkic communities. And Iran, for instance, one quarter of the population of Iran is mother language is Azeri Turkish. You can still find villages in northern Iraq, northern Syria where people speak Turkish. Bulgaria was 10% Turkish. Um, it's uh, Turkish speaking. So the, the sense of a Turkish identity is, is uh, quite widespread. And the reason for this is that the Turks, historically, 1,000 years ago, came out of Central Asia. The, 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 the mythical homeland of the Turks is around the Altai Mountains. And they moved westwards. And they conquered in, 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 in several empires and waves of, uh, waves of conquest. They conquered most, most of this area at one time. Most famous, the most famous of them being Genghis Khan, who's not actually Turkish, he was a Mongol, but his armies were substantially Turkish. And um, the weird, a, a weird statistic I came across in, in reporting this book was that 8% of the men in this area are somehow related to Genghis Khan. He had many wives. Um, and this, this is not, I'm not talking you, to you about dry history here. This is, this is part of the Turkish national narrative in a Turkish, uh, a Turkish textbook at school. They would, they would tell you that we come from Central Asia. And indeed, this is probably how they looked. I took this picture in a Turkic republic called Kar Karakal Pakistan. It's part of Uzbekistan. And people are still very proud of that legacy of conquest. It's, it's sort of like a nice counterpart for the, uh, or a, 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 this, this feeling of being inferior ever since. And um, the, the old nomadic roots of the Turks are still very much alive today. Um, these pictures, are, this one on the top left is from uh, a mountain in China where this is a Kazakh Turkic encampment. Um, the, uh, the, uh, and below is in Uzbekistan. These are uh, uh, camel, milk, camel uh, herders. But in today's Turkey, much of the metaphors in, in modern Turkish still come from animals, um, from all the different uh, kinds of, uh, of yogurts and cheeses. Yogurt, by the way, a Turkish word. Bulgaria disputes that, but um, the Turks definitely feel it's theirs. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, this, this, this nomadic animal husbandry past is very much, again, another layer of what's in the Turkish identity still today. And it's not just about um, you know, food or ethnicity. It's also about popular customs. This on the top is a scene from 500 years ago in a miniature in the Topkapi Palace. It's during the entertainments surrounding the uh, circumcision ceremonies for one of the sons of the Sultan 500 years ago in Istanbul. The lower picture I took, which I am sure you would agree is remarkably similar, I took that in China in a Turkic community where they were having uh, entertainments. I could show you many other pictures of people who look the same, who people who dress the same as in pictures in the past and, and the present and how people, you can meet people in Xinjiang today and they look just like my friends in Istanbul. It's, 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 it is a remarkable thing. And you have politicians using this. It's not just Turkey that says Turkicness is, is something. The, the gentleman on the left, uh, I took that picture I think in 1990. He was a, a, a rebel in, in the Republic of Azerbaijan. But he insisted on his Turkishness. And uh, when he came to power, he, he believed so much in the myths of the ancient Turks who were led to safety by a wolf that his interior minister kept a stuffed gray wolf by his desk. 
Um, they, they, they were not a completely incompetent administration and lost power very quickly. But um, he won 54% of the vote, and he represented a Turkishness that's beyond Turkey. The gentleman on the right, Nursultan Nazarbayev, this picture was taken on his plane. He, uh, he, he accepted to meet me uh, only if I flew with him to Singapore from his capital, Astana. And I was astonished when I asked him, so who are you? What is your identity? And he said, oh, I, I'm a Turk. He said, now, of course, we think of him as a Kazakh, but he said, I am a Turk. And he looked at me, because I looked a bit taken aback, and he said, ah, yeah, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about those people in Turkey, but I'll have you know that, yes, we sent some armies westward 500 years ago. They conquered that place, and they married the local population. But if you want the real Turks, they're here. Okay. And who's to say he's wrong? Because uh, he's not the only, of course, it's not the only wave of conquest, is that Someone who was a leader 500 years before Nazarbayev in Central Asia, a man called Babur, he was in uh, the Fagana Valley of uh, what is now Uzbekistan. Um, he, he called himself a Turk. He wrote his diaries. We know that he called himself a Turk because he says, I am a Turk. Um, and he couldn't find enough to, to eat or feed his armies or run his kingdom in Central Asia. So he went and took over Afghanistan, got tired of that or was chased out, and then went and conquered India. Babur, and he founded the Mughal dynasty, which is called the Mughal dynasty, but is actually founded by someone who thinks of himself as a Turk. And um, in fact, even today, if you think of India, you think of the language Urdu, uh, which is actually a Pakistani language, but of course also spoken very similar to Hindi. But Urdu is, why is it called Urdu? Because the army of Babur, who conquered India, uh, is the, was the place that generated, was, uh, generated the new language of, uh, of the realm, or the, the empire, of the Mughal Empire. And Urdu in Turkish just means army. It's army. So um, the, the Turkish influence is, is much wider than you might expect. Okay, come back to, coming back to Turkey. Okay, so we have these expansive Muslim dimensions, we have this Turkic dimension, but then, of course, when the Turks conquered the, the, the country of Anatolia, over about 400 years it took them to completely bring it under control, um, they conquered the Byzantine Empire. But the Byzantine Empire didn't just disappear. The Turks, in fact, when they first came to Anatolia, were only about 10% of the existing population there. They took over an existing state. These, these are the walls that are still standing today outside Istanbul, built by the Byzantines. This is a Byzantine palace that's still there on the walls of Istanbul. And in fact, the, the, Ottoman, the, the Ottoman dynasty took the, the, the Byzantine government over from them. And uh, in, uh, until the 1950s, the Chamber of Commerce in Istanbul was still majority Greek and minority. It was uh, so it's, it's a very slow process. So if, you know, it, there's nothing black and white about who is Turkish there. Another layer that, is not, that has come back recently is the whole idea of the Ottoman Empire, which I th most of us think disappeared in 1923 with the, the birth of the new Republic of Turkey. But the latest government since, 19, since 2002 in Turkey, the, uh, the Justice and Development Party, has made a very conscious effort to revive Ottomanism because they believe that's a more cohesive way of looking at the country uh, than the old Republicans who were all secularist and modernist and positivist and so forth. And the, the Justice and Development Party are very religious, rather pragmatic, and, uh, and, uh, and have a different view. And so now we're getting all this, 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 this new imagery of the Ottoman Empire back again. It's all completely artificial, of course, but um, it, it also has a certain reality because, you know, the street outside my house has all these Ottoman things around still, and you still feel part of it. And on the right, of course, the... the, the, the Domobahce Palace, where um, uh, the, one of the last palaces of the sultans, and now where uh, President Erdogan likes to work when he's in Istanbul. So things, history is coming round and round again. Indeed, but our, the current president is exaggerating a bit. Uh, he's, built, he's built a palace which has a, a, a floor surface apparently four times the size of Versailles, and um, 
He, this is his latest trick, his stunt. He's got uh, Mahmoud Abbas from Palestine visiting, and he's showing off by having 16 armed men representing all the historic Turkic Empire's leaders. The White Huns, the, 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 the Golden Horde, the Black, the Black Sheep Turks, the White Sheep Turks, the, you know, all these ancient dynasties, the Seljuks, Genghis, everyone is there being represented. Uh, you know, this is going a bit far for most people in Turkey, but um, I'm just pointing out the, the, the sort of echoes of, of grandeur. So why is this? Why does Turkey feel the need to, to, uh, to, to, to make, make this, um, these this sort of gestures? Well, one reason is that when the Republic was founded in 1923, it was practically emptied of its, uh, of its original middle classes, if you like. The cities of the Ottoman Empire had, uh, had been completely depleted. There was the Armenian Genocide, which destroyed the Armenian communities of, uh, of Anatolia, and there was a, a population exchange with the Greek population. This town here on the south coast of Turkey, uh, near Kash, in, uh, in um, oh, sorry, near Fethiye, actually, Fethiye on the south coast of Turkey, uh, still stands it's as it was left by the Greek population in 1923. But it's, it's like an aching hole in the Turkish psyche. And I would say it's the same for the Armenians. The Armenians are also an aching hole in the Turkish psyche. It's a very important element of the identity. And a lot of what you see is sometimes an attempt to make up for it. And the loss of the Armenians and Greeks of the... Of the of Anatolia was a huge, um, uh, left a huge gap that Turkey has spent most of the last century trying to fill with new middle classes. And, of course, during this period, there was another dynamic, which was that all the Muslim populations of that vast old Ottoman Empire came back into Turkey, sort of United States in reverse, as it were. And th these pictures I took in, in Bulgaria in 1989, which was a huge wave of refugees. 350,000 people came in one month to Turkey. But it was just the last of many such waves of people who've come to Anatolia. And these people often came from the Balkans. They were often educated people uh, who had positions in the towns of the Ottoman Empire. And it's, it's the descendants of these people who became usually the secularist, modernist, positive, new inhabitants, the new middle classes that supported the secular republic, whereas the, um, the, the more Ottoman-style people tended to be the, 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 the more religious-minded people, tended to be the rural po Muslim population of Anatolia. And until today, it tends to be they who support AK Party, whereas the descendants of the Balkan refugees in the west of the country who are more European and more positivist in approach are the ones who support the, the, the Republican parties. And sometimes living in Istanbul, it does feel a bit like Turkey's trying to fill shoes that are a bit too big for it. But the new generation of, 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 of Turks on the left, you'll see, you know, perfectly, uh, perfectly middle class now. Another element of that has to be understood to, uh, to, to, to understand Turkey is the, the, um, the, the sense that the republic was founded against the will of the Western great powers. It was, a, it was a war of liberation. And it is true that Britain and France and Italy and others were trying to destroy Turkey at the time. And Ataturk, who's the founder of modern Turkey in the middle, um, is, was a great hero in managing to do that against the odds with almost no support except from the Soviet Union. A lot of people remember Turkey as a NATO ally. They forget that the actual founding of Turkey was done almost in defiance of the West. And that is very important when thinking of who Turkey really thinks of it as its friends, which is not many countries, by the way. Um, the, uh, the latest poll thinks, I think it's 40% of Turks believe that Turkey has no close friends. And um, the, next, the only friend it has is a country called Azerbaijan. And I won't even go into that. And just so some, some symbols. This, this idea of Turkey being the victim. I was once in the Turkish foreign ministry, and a diplomat told me, Hugh, everything that comes out of this building proceeds from the assumption that we are the victim. Okay? And this, this comedian here, who was a fantastic comedian, is also always, always his sketches were based on the idea of this personal victimhood against the state, against fate, or whatever. Um, and indeed, he, he went on to become a, a mayoral candidate for an extreme left-wing party 
and got no votes either, so he, he was indeed a victim. And I, don't, I think this monument to the 50th anniversary of the Republic speaks for itself in, its, uh, in what it's trying to say. So the big man, the big man is very important, protecting uh, a, a crushed people. And his picture is obviously in many offices in Turkey and is very much part of the Turkish uh, backstory at all times. But a new picture that's come recently to, um, uh, to, to symbolize where we have come from as Turks is these two uh, uh, conscripts who presumably were fighting in the Gallipoli campaign on the Turkish side or in the First World War on some front. And uh, many people in modern Turkey now feel uh, 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 a sense of, gosh, look how well we're doing now. Look who we owe it to. Look who fought for us. Turkey is also a country that has changed unbelievably since I've been there in 25 years. When I first arrived in Turkey, there were no, Istanbul had no buildings really above 10 stories high, to, only two, two five-star hotels, only um, uh, no groceries, very few restaurants that served anything except Turkish food. And the idea of the countryside was completely off limits. If you were an advertising executive, you would not ever dream of putting anything about rural Turkey in any of your copy or imagery because for most Turks the idea of the countryside was hard unremitting labor difficult times this is this is extreme by the way this is on the the Syrian border uh, yeah yeah these are these are very rare now people don't live in these but you know until recently it's very much in the, in, in the folk memory very male dominated the, the countryside um, you know not that different from other South European countries, I guess, um, but definitely uh, very much about male, maleness. These, these gentlemen here are explaining to me the Viagra-like effects of dried figs. <laughs> if you wish to try it, you can. But um, Turkey, as I said, has changed. This, is, this, is, this picture is even from 15, 15 years ago, but it gives you an idea. We, there is now not just one financial district, but two financial districts rising above Istanbul. And uh, it has completely changed the character of the city. And part of that change is the way Turks have become entrepreneurs. My friend Mehmet on the left, his father got his start on this, on this very same beach, going off into the waters of the Gallipoli Peninsula to bring up metal from the, the, the ships of the Allied fleet that were sunk in the Dardanelles in 1915. He, he sold the metal, very high quality British steel and French steel, and gradually made uh, small ships. His son is now building 5,000 ton um, ships, one of which is behind him, and uh, trading with those ships up and down the west coast of Africa. This is a typical story of how a Turkish company has done well. And another change in Turkey is these, these ladies here on the right are Dutch Turks who've come back to Istanbul to work uh, in call centers serving Europe, but preferring to be in Istanbul because it's a happening place for them. Okay. I've skimmed over the ethnic side of things because I'm never quite sure where to go with it, but 15% of the population of Turkey is Kurdish. And one of the great problems of the Turkish presentation of its identity is that it is called Turkey. It's been called Turkey a long time. The British poet Chaucer, even in the 14th century, um, was calling Turkey, Turkey. But Turkey, the word Turk, as it's used as a, to describe a Turkish citizen, is also the word used to describe an ethnic Turkish speaker or an ethnic Turk. And that, of course, grates with the Kurdish population. And they don't like it. And the, there's left is, a, is sort of a group of Kurdish children in a, in a village. And on the right is a, is a Kurdish guerrilla leader, Sabri Ok. But even though someone like Sabri Ok is fighting in the name of these children to protect a Kurdish identity, Sabri Ok spoke to me in his headquarters in Turkish. He had been educated in a Turkish university. He had been the guest of the Turkish government for 20 years in a Turkish jail. He said to me that he felt as though he, he was living in Turkey, even in his mountain hideout. Uh, and he clearly envisaged a, an ideal future in Turkey. So it's a question in Turkey at the moment of sorting that linguistic problem out. And uh, I think as part of the peace process that Sabri Ok is in, involved with, with the Turkish government right now, which uh, 
at my organization, which we're quite involved in, we're quite hopeful about still, um, I think they proceed from the idea that actually the best thing is that most Turks, most Kurds want to live in a, in a successful Turkey. But unfortunately, of course, that there's many a slip between cup and lip, and uh, it may not happen, but I think that that's what most Kurds would like if they got their full rights, which they certainly deserve. And just to give you an example of a, an image of how being, Kurd being Kurdish doesn't necessarily mean that you're anti-Turkey, uh, here are some Kurdish horsemen on the uh, Iranian frontier a few years ago. By the way, I was being taken around by a Turkish general at that time, so maybe there was a reason that they were, they were slow, but it, it, I think it, it, it reflects an underlying truth. Okay, I'm, the, I'm, I'm really ending up now. The, um, the other thing in, in that, that Ataturk had to do when he was creating his new Turk that is, uh, is, is, a, is a fairly dominant part of the, that, that mix of things which is Turkishness today, was that he had to basically reinvent an ideology for his country. And what he did was he did something that's very similar to what Turkey is doing today. He imported things from Europe. And he, you know, we, we talk about the European Union accession process at the moment with Turkey of bringing in laws and discussing them and pushing them in steady. Ataturk just took them wholesale and wrote them in Turkish and said this is the new law from Switzerland, from Germany, from Italy, from France. And also for women, he said, right, you're not going to wear headscarves anymore. You're going you're to look modern. You're going to wear dresses. You're going to dance even with men who are not your husbands. And he insisted on it. But you can see the women are somewhat reluctant to show their, their hair immediately, but they're definitely trying to look modern. And uh, it's, a, it's a very important uh, part of what makes uh, the, the, the Republican side of Turkey proud that, uh, that Ataturk managed to do this with a fairly uh, uh, basic population. But at the same time, uh, I don't think that anybody felt that in Turkey that they were losing any of their Muslim, their, their Muslim identity. They felt that they were just becoming a slightly different kind of Muslim. And for instance, these, these gentlemen here, if you told these gentlemen that they were less than anything 100% Muslim for drinking the Turkish national uh, alcohol, Raku, they would be extremely insulted. They would not, they would not see this as an anti-Islamic anti thing. They would know it was a bit naughty, but they wouldn't see it as a sin. And I think it's just, would go to say that, uh, uh, that uh, show that uh, the religious, religious culture of all Muslim countries is different and should never be aggregated into one thing. That map at the beginning was rather, rather superficial. And uh, one should be very careful of, uh, of jumping to conclusions about what is and what isn't uh, religious identity. Similarly with the, what Ataturk did for women, the lady on the left is Turkey's first woman prime minister, Tansu Çiller, a truly dreadful and corrupt prime minister. Um, but um, still a woman who was widely admired at the time for having managed to get to the top of the slippery pile of, of Turkish politics and representing what Ataturk was thought to have wanted. Um, and in that sense, I think represents something pretty positive in Turkey. The lady on the right, for a Republican Turkish person, would say, ah, this is a reactionary person who's trying to drag Turkey back to the dark old days and, uh, this is, uh, and she's, uh, she, should be, she should be outlawed. But I think you can look at it differently. I mean, as I said, you know, Tansu Chilo was hardly an upstanding example of moral uh, propriety. Um, and this lady here, I, I, when I look at her, I see, gosh, this is a, a woman who's actually um, taking a political stand. She's standing in front of an audience uh, uh, asserting herself, which her mother would certainly never have done. So I think when you're looking at it, you have to accept that there's a... There's a timeline, and this lady is on a timeline that is moving towards a, 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 a new place. And it's, it's not uh, just because she wears a headscarf that she's necessarily backward. And something else, I noticed that the Holland Festival was using a, an image very like this. What people may not know about these whirling dervishes in Istanbul is that the ones in white there are fairly standard. These are, these are men drawing on the godhead and, and whirling. But the red one is a woman. Okay, in other Muslim countries, this would be unthinkable that you would have women in a, in a religious ceremony like this. Women in Turkey are also 
trying to get a place in the mosque. They're, 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 okay, they're still in the back. It's still rather like Catholicism, perhaps two, three hundred years ago, or you know, or any other religion that's in in transition. But they're pushing, and in funerals now, women will come quite far, close to the front of the mosque mosque ceremony. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that you wouldn't see anywhere else in the Muslim world. And I just saw an advertisement for a Turkish hotel, the Steinberger in Maslach, if you're interested, that is entire, the senior management is entirely female, um, something which I, I don't think you'd find readily anywhere else. Um, so that's the last of the slides. I mean, I just, I think I owe you a, a, a sort of a, a conclusion, you know, does the, does the Turk exist or not? Um, I had to answer this question in, in, in my book, which is um, The Sons of the Conquerors, and I really sweated over that paragraph because it's, it's really difficult to sort of just cap encapsulate a, a people that you don't know whether it's just one country or is it 24 countries? Is it now or is it uh, historic? Is it the last 100, 1,500 years since Turks have been historically listed? Um, and eventually I just sat down, well, what do I think that people were like in the areas that they spoke Turkish? And I would say that the Yes, there's a, there's a kind of audio-visual preference. People are not, it's not, a, not really strong on the written culture. Um, the, the singing that you just participated in is one of the wonderful things about Turkey is that people in restaurants will spontaneously start singing around a table and all, everybody will know the song. And uh, it's, it, it's very much a culture that's, that's living in the present. It's, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain warmth attached to that, the hospitality towards strangers. Uh, a viciousness towards your unliked members of the family. On the other hand, um, uh, exaggerating a bit, but um, there's, there is a, there is, that's counterbalanced with, I think, a, a, a trust in the family as your basic guarantee. You would not trust the state, for instance, to, to guarantee you in bad times. You would trust your family and you would use them as your bank, your, the way you'd get your spare car from or your new house or whatever. Uh, another thing I think you could say is that um, people in the Turkish area, they, they tend to live in the present. They don't really have much thinking about the past um, going on. It's not, not, not a lot of, uh, it's, it's a very spontaneous culture. And, th and there's definitely a genius. And I'll just leave you with one last thought in, from the Kazakh Turks, um, who they claim that they can always tell um, that someone is Kazakh by looking them in the eye. And there is something. There's a genius somewhere in the, in the Turkish look. And if you go onto the Istanbul metro, you will see it too. No one's reading. No one's got their head buried in newspapers. Or books. They're all looking around, seeing, seeking out human contact. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, thank you very much. You both, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, you. Um, so, so how, I'm just curious, how did this all... Uh, start your fascination with, with Turkey and things Turkish? A complete accident, of course. I, I studied Persian and Arabic, and after about seven years in Iran and Arab countries, I worked out that they were not going to get anywhere in my lifetime. And, um, uh, well, because I was, I, I was working as a news agency reporter and having to go to pretty horrible things the whole time. Um, you wanted happier news. And yes, and I had a big argument with my boss in Beirut, and the first job that came up was in Istanbul. And then I got hooked, because the Middle East is Persian culture, Arabic culture, and the top side of the triangle is Turkish culture. It's very important, and I didn't realize that before, because Turkey is such a sort of unknown black box for most people, and it was for me too. And um, so it became... Um, yes, it became the, the, I wouldn't say it became the, the Middle East that I'd always wanted, but it, something, something Middle Eastern in Turkey's soul satisfies me, as it, but I also very much like that European ambition. How long did it take for you to, uh, to actually master Turkish, the language? Oh, two or three years, yeah. It's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a, a steep initial ingra gradient, but once you, it's a ruthlessly logical spelling system. Mm -hmm. The verb system is, is, it's an immaculately designed language. It's just uh, everything has to be learned off by heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you just said something that I find quite, quite triggering. You said um, Turkish uh, culture is, is a bit of a black box to most people. 
what is it about jerky that makes it such a such a mystery or unknown, less known? Because they were never defeated. They were never colonized. If you look at how uh, perhaps Holland and Indonesia, I'm not sure, I think that's a possibly a bad example because you've kind of taken that out of your national consciousness, but Britain and India is perhaps a better... Um, Touche. No, sorry. But, but, uh, but certainly there's an, uh, there's an awareness of Indonesia, right? And an interest in Indonesia resulting from the colonial experience. And similarly for Britain and India or um, uh, France and, uh, and some of its colonies, because the, 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 the mother cultures that we are familiar with know these places, but um, Turkey has never been very inviting to outsiders to come in. I mean, even today, there are only 17,000 work permits given to foreigners in Turkey every year. It's a country of 80 million people. Okay, okay there's millions of tourists, but they're herded into hotels, all, all expenses included. You know, so they, 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 there is a, a sense of uh, not wishing for too much interaction. Um, but I, I think the main problem is that, um, that people... You know, the, 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 the countries of the West did not administer Turkey and their, their encounters with Turkey were not gratifying. I mean, Gallipoli was a disaster for, for Britain and Australia and uh, the Turks are most uh, puzzled by the way that the, Amer the Australians and New Zealanders and British come every year to celebrate this enormous defeat in Gallipoli. Um, and um, Brit the whole British army was destroyed in Iraq by the Ottoman army. Yes, the, the, the British managed to force the... Um, the Ottoman armies out of the Middle East, but uh, what, a, what a great thing they won. Um, but again, I, I think the lack of contact, lack of, um, uh, uh, lack of awareness and... Uh, and exposure. And exposure. Uh, also, as a journalist, it was remarkable to me always that it was almost impossible, either with, with European or with um, American media, to place stories that were just about Turkey. If you said, this story is going to tell you about Turkey in the Middle East, or <coughs> Turkey in... Uh, and Islam, or mm. Turkey's role model for the world, or something. They would, the editors would always go, oh, great, yes, that's, that's the Turkey we like. But if you were going to write about something, about something internal about Turkey, there would be very little interest. What do you think is the m biggest misconception about Turkey, outside of Turkey? I think just the biggest problem is that there's no real conception. I don't think people know, uh, know the Turks. I think that in, in Europe and places like Ho uh, Holland, for instance, I think the, the misconception is probably that Dutch people will look at the, um, the Turkish immigrant family on their street and think that that is Turkey. Whereas for, if you live in Turkey and you meet the, the immigrant families, they, they've, they've created a new culture of their own. It's, it's not un-Turkish, but it's not today's Turkey either. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, uh, yeah, to, to know Turkey, one needs to go to actually beyond Istanbul. Istanbul is a kind of spaceship hovering over the Bosphorus Strait. It's not, it has many char characteristics of Turkey, but it's not the real Turkey. It's, it's kind of a self, self uh, uh, a world unto itself. What do you think um, uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk would make of today's Turkey? Well, I think he'd be quite proud, actually. Would he? Yeah. yeah it's, it's, I think the independence of Turkey was never taken for granted by Atatürk. He was, I mean, he, they, 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 were, uh, they were on their last, uh, down to their last few artillery rounds at one point. And the, the idea that they would manage to, to, to continue and to now have a bit of, a, of an external, sh to cast a bit of an external shadow, he, he would like that. He would not like the Islamic overtones of the current incumbent of the presidency. Um, but, hey, that's the fashion. Mm -hmm. Speaking about... Uh, um, you know, politics, there's, there's elections uh, yeah. uh, coming up. Uh, actually, we saw a few, I, I just got a, a call from my mom who lives in the east of, of the Netherlands um, yeah. in a village near Deventer. And she said, yeah, we had like half of the Turkish, the Dutch Turkish community, we had them here. And I was like, what happened? It turned out that Deventer was one of the two places where uh, Dutch Turks could actually yeah. vote. Yeah. Um, are, there any, are there any surprises uh, that we might expect or... Well, those of us who've been predicting the downfall of the great man uh, have lost our money so many times that we're very reluctant to say, now you will see. I mean, 
honestly, everyone I speak to in my little corner of Istanbul is never going to vote for Erdogan. No. And yet, he will win probably 45% of the vote. And I can't explain that except that the people that vote for him are a constituency. As I said, that old rural believing population and they see quite clearly and I believe completely rationally that if they vote him out, if they lose him, they will lose the entire mechanism that has given them work and contracts and, uh, and uh, access to power mm. for over the last 12 years. So even though they know he's corrupt, it's, it's without a doubt his senior advisors know exactly what's going on. Um, that, uh, you know, There's still that, a vested interest in maintaining the status yes, quo. Yes, it is. The, certainly for that community, yes. Right, and right. plus, Turkey is not that, you know, th th it's not all bad that's happening. I mean, the roads of provincial Turkey are immensely improved. The buses of Istanbul are new and pleasant and a nice to use. At last, there is a bit of a metro system in Istanbul. High-speed train to Konya, uh, infrastructural is, projects like that. Is that yeah. what makes... Yeah, it, these, things, these things have happened. Mm. I don't know where the money's come from. Um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 but it, these things, things have happened, and that, that means things to people in Turkey. And uh, yes, it, they've been built by, by a new generation of contractors that are uh, associated with this group in power. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's politics, and certainly that's politics in Turkey. And when, you, when you started your, um, your lecture, you said that... Um, um making fun of Turkish identity would not be such a good idea in, um, in Erdogan's uh, Turkey. What about doubting uh, Turkish identity or questioning it? Would that be, would that be risky business? I think it's, it's like everything in the world. It depends how you say it. If you say it nicely and in a nice, warm and inclusive way, you can talk about almost anything in Turkey. But if you wish to stand up and challenge and say that, Turks don't deserve to exist and sort of reading your, your thing in, in a public context in Istanbul or Ankara or somewhere. I mean, yeah, people wouldn't, wouldn't understand it as a joke, no. And there, there, there are legal provisions. Um, yes, there are still legal provisions that would protect the brand name of Turkishness from such uh, doubts. Yes. Mm -hmm. Turkey, copyright. <laughs> yeah. um, we have time for two questions from the audience. Now, this is always a hard moment. Two questions, that's not a lot. Um, but at this point, I would like to see if there's anybody who would like to ask you a question. Yes. I enjoyed very much your lecture. I would say, why should one doubt the identity of the Turks? For Turkey is the only successful nation state in the Middle East. So there is created something like Turkish identity in a successful way. Of course, there is the Kurdish uh, problem, and that is the, the, the only uh, real uh, challenge for uh, the Turkish uh, state. Do you think that the Kurdish problem is really a challenge and a danger for Turkey, for the identity and the stability of the Turkish nation state? Thank you. Yep. Yep. Just hold, hold that thought. I'm going to see if there's one more question I can collect. In the... Yes. I want to ask, uh, how did Turkey change you personally? Ah. Yeah. Nice question. All right, so let's start with the first question. Yes. The Kurdish question. I agree so with you. Uh, Turkey is a pretty successful country, and one of the refreshing changes in Turkey over the last 30 years that I've been there is that when I first came to Turkey, everybody would always ask me, do you like it here? You, you know, do you, what do you think of Turkey? And it was, a, it, was a, it was a passionate interest. People would publish whole page interviews with me in newspapers describing my feelings about Turkey as if it really mattered. And it, it was, of course, a, 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 a symptom of an, a huge insecurity. That insecurity has almost gone. And Turkey is a much more self-confident country, even though there's this polarization over the president and the, the, dan the lurking danger of the Kurdish uh, um, insurgency and, and, and so forth. Uh, I think that um, Turkey is indeed a successful nation state, not the only successful nation state. Iran is also, uh, has chosen a very lonely route, of course, but um, it, it is also a great power of the Middle East, and God knows that Egypt has uh, got a few thousand years behind it and still seems to be going strong. Uh, 
strong, that's the wrong word, but you know, still, still, still going. Um, it's the other countries that don't have such a, a long state tradition that have difficulties. You know, the, the countries which were s splintered off, like, well, yeah, but um, the French helped. Yeah. Um, um, and how did uh, Turkey change me? Um, He is still successful. No, but do you, do you think still that Erdogan's actions will be successful among the Kurds? It's, it's a big question whether the Kurdish party will get over 10%. It will be absolutely wonderful if the, the, the Kurdish party gets over 10% because that will mean that Kurdishness is right in the heart of the politics, that whatever changes to the, the constitutional description of Turkishness, the the education system, the, the local government arrangements, all the things that have to change to bring peace in this conflict can be discussed in some kind of forum in Ankara with this group, and that, that'll be great. But if on Sunday the Kurdish party gets under 10%, then we have a real problem. Because, because they, then a political solution will be less feasible. Yes, because they will go to Diyarbakir and announce some sort of autonomous parliament. and, and, and uh, So th there's a lot to play for on Sunday, but uh, and I... I couldn't tell you whether they're going to get over 10%. But, um, okay. As for how Turkey changed me, well, it's educated me. I mean, well, I learned uh, economics with uh, Turgut Özal. I learned about, um, I knew nothing before Turgut Özal. At least I knew something after Turgut Özal. Um, uh, we, we learned how to make stock markets. We learned how to do, to do trade. We, he, he, he lectured us a lot. Um, Turkey's openings to Caucasus and Central Asia after 1991 were a wonderful opportunity to go and visit countries that, as they were born and then to fly on the Turkish Airlines planes that were coming and going. And it was, it was a great privilege or to be part of the president's uh, jet. Well, that was the Kazakh guy. Yeah, yeah. 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 He, he was quite something. By the way, in the Kazakh presidential jet, journalists and policemen fly in the back. I just had half an hour with him at the front, took my photo and asked him my question. After that, it was back to the toilet seat, yes. Um, but, uh, I, think, I think Turkey's given me a great deal. It's, given, it's been a, it, it tolerated me. I, it uh, allowed me to be whoever I wanted to be in Istanbul. But I suppose the strange thing about being a foreigner in, in Turkey is that you are given great freedom but you also have no responsibility, no rights, and you never know quite long how long it lasts. So you, have, you remain polite and uh, constructive, that's fine. If you were to turn uh, uh, highly critical and start pressing on bits which hurt, you, wouldn't, you would have no rights, you would, you would not last long. And during my time in Turkey, I've seen some foreign journalists who really focused on uh, issues that the government didn't like would eventually have to leave. So there was, there was, there was a bit of a, 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 of a path to walk, but I think on the whole, the experience of living there has been incredibly fulfilling. Um, and uh, it's given me the opportunity, since I could never get any job in England, um, <laughs> to, to, um, to actually um, write about interesting things that seemed new. And I'm very grateful for that. Speaking about writing interesting things, what's the next topic of research? Um, well, my next book will be about building a house in a Turkish village, mm. yeah. which is a lot less boring than you might think. And you, <laughs> you, go, you go past these Turkish villages and they look like nothing, and then you learn about the dramas and, and, uh, and dead bodies. And dead bodies? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's, and, uh, and family, family uh, rows and... Uh, Yes, uh, well, it was, uh, that, that, but that, that, that book has uh, been finished, but not yet uh, published, so that's All the right, well, we'll keep a close look. Yeah, uh, ladies and you. gentlemen, please give him another round of applause. You, Pope, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Very much. Please have a seat. Now, it's time for another musical